Um, I started the recording, so we're live. Also for the people that uh, watch it back on Moodle. Um, so um, uh, there was a question by Rizvan. I like the gifts. Um, will you say something about when and where you upload the PPT and task homework? So the the, the assignments and the lecture, um, the PowerPoint and stuff. I will uh, upload today. Um, so you can start directly after the lecture. Um, the recording will not include the GIFs. So if you want the funny GIFs, you have to come to the Twitch lecture. So that's kind of the stick that I have to force you to do it. Um, oh yeah, sure, sure. I will, I, I will make a note and I will upload them beforehand. And all right yeah no that's that's easier for you guys that um the lectures will also be saved by twitch so you can watch them back for 14 days i think um after which they get automatically deleted um one of the nice things about watching the lectures on twitch is that you also get the chat on the side um, so the local recording doesn't have the chat so that's why i kind of read out some of the questions so that when people watch it later on moodle um, they can also um, they can also know what the question was that I'm answering. All right, so the look and feel of R, this is how it looked on my Windows 7 machine. Um, this is how it looks currently on my machine. So I'm using just the standard R. I'm, I'm, I'm generally not using um, the R Studio. Um, although if you want to use R Studio, that's that's fine with me. Um, I generally use a system where I use R and I just use Notepad++. So this is my programming window. And then here I have the execution of the program because I like to keep those two things separate. Um, the reason why that is, is because originally I started programming in, um, um, in, in C. What is the difference between R and R Studio? There is no difference. Um, R Studio is um, a shell around R. Um, and that's all it is. It has a built-in text editor, um, but I don't like the text editor in R Studio because I, I like Notepad++. It has like syntax highlighting and um, brackets and these kinds of things. I think the newer versions of R Studio have that as well. Um, General Gulak, would you recommend R Studio for us beginners? No, I would actually advise against using R Studio. Um, it our studio is easy in a way because it has these uh, it has this additional window where you can see which objects are loaded and you can load libraries by just clicking on it um, the the main issue that i have with our studio is that it makes it really easy to create scripts which are not um, um, th which which are not reproducible because if you click on loading a library then you generally don't type in that you need to load the library. So, um, I mean, um, can we use our studio? Yes, of course you can use our studio. You could use R in the command line if you want. Like programming in R is nothing more than, than writing a text document. It's just writing something like, um, something like okay so i want to load a certain library for example a library that allows me to do qtl mapping um, then i want to set my working directory somewhere so i want to go somewhere on my hard drive for example in the d drive um, and then i am going to read something so i'm going to use read table to load in data.csv or something right um, and then i have to say separator equals uh, comma because it's a comma separated file the thing is, is that in R Studio, um, you can load something by just clicking and dragging it, but then it's not in the script. And one of these things about um, programming for scientific work is that everything needs to be reproducible. And what I generally do is I type the script that I want, and then I just do Control A, Control C, then I switch to R. Um, and this, of course, will create errors because I don't have a file which which is called data.csv. Um, and then I just paste it in. And then, yeah, of course, it will give me an error because this file doesn't exist. Um, but that's the way that I do programming. And this forces me to keep the script in such a way that it will kind of run from beginning to end without any errors. Um, and our studio 
it has its advantages, especially for beginners, because you can go back and forth when you have multiple plots, um, and you can click on loading a library. Um, but this makes so that you can create scripts which are not... Um, um, by writing a script, I always include the library like in LaTeX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, you need to write down which libraries you load. And in our studio, you can just click these libraries, and then it can even save these. So next time that you start our studio, it already loaded those libraries. So you're not going to add that to your script. So in a way, it it forgets the dependencies, right? If you move to another computer, which has a different setup of our studio. Um, it might be that your script is now starting to produce errors because you did not load the library that you require. Um, so, and that's that's why I generally advise people to start with just using a basic text editor, something like Notepad++. Um, and uh, the nice thing about um, for didactic reasons, nah, kind of. Um, generally, our studio is really good when up until you reach a certain point. Um, but could you not control that by using Anaconda? Yeah, but then you're using like an extra, <laughs> and then like your scripts will only work when people have Anaconda installed. And, and it's not reproducible, right? Reproducible research means that you have a script, you have data, and by having these two things, you can run the whole analysis. Um, so there's a, and, and one of the nice things about, about Notepad++, which I love to use, especially under Windows, is that you have like bracket highlighting. So if I if I select the bracket, it will highlight the corresponding one. So if I make a mistake and like close this one, which is not opened, then now I directly know because it doesn't highlight the. So I'm, I know that I've missed the bracket somewhere. Um, why Notepad++? That's kind of irrelevant. Um, you can use any text editor, just don't use the standard Notepad that comes with Windows because that one's really, really poor and doesn't support these things. Um, one of the nice things is, is that if I would save this file, um, let me save it somewhere, and I say um, script.r and just save it here. Whoa. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just save it there. Um, it will also highlight keywords, so it will color keywords that it recognizes, and it will color also things like the start and the end of a string. Um, but yeah, there's there's many ways to do R, um, and the nice thing about doing it in a separate text editor is that when you start using external computers, so for example, you have a script which uses like a lot of memory or requires you to have like 30 CPU cores, um, then you can easily copy paste the script into a terminal window um, and run the script on another computer and not your local machine. Um, and that is where things like RStudio really start becoming a drawback. Um, but I ain't forcing you to do, you can you can do whatever you want, right? That's programming, so you have to find the structure that works best for you. But the structure that works best for me um, is just having a separate script um, where I type my, my code and then copy pasting it into R. And then once I copy pasted it, I actually close R to make sure that I don't have variables floating around. Um, and this happens, for example, when you do something like x equals 5, um, and then, hey, you now have like 30 or 40 additional lines of code, and then you start using x. And at that point, it, like, it might be that it's saved in your session or, or other problems. So in, in, in my mind, Scripts are different from data, so scripts are written in the text editor. Data is either made by Excel files or other text files or like getting it online. Um, so I try to keep these things separate. Um, not only that, but when I make a script, I always put in a header. So I always say something like this, so a script as an example on how to create a script. And I always add something like Denny Arendt's 2021 HU Berlin. And I add a copyright sign in front. So just that people know who did it, when it was done, and which company or which thing I worked for. And this is, of course, um, 
Do you need to close or is there also a clear command? There actually is a clear command. So um, you can use um, uh, remove all objects, um, which is the command this. And this thing is good to always put as the first line because then it clears the entire R session of everything that there is um, and then you start off with a fresh R session. So you don't have to close it every time but I generally tend to close it. Um, and that's just to kind of prevent things which are from an older session or from another script um, because when you're working on big projects you might have like five or six different scripts which you run one behind another and then of course like my scripts or when I when I think about good scripts it starts by loading the libraries setting where you are on your computer so the, the working directory loading in data and then generally the last line of my script is something like a write table um, where I write out the data after I've done all my manipulations and that is that is kind of the way that I that I that I work and I found that this works very well especially if you it, because it, it forces you to write down everything that you do so I, I treat programming as having a lab book um, where you write everything down that's the script and then you have your workbench where you do the stuff and that is the R window right so this is my lab book and this is my experiment um, and that's kind of how I try to separate those two but of course if you want to learn or if you want to use our studio because you think that um, the editor in our studio is much nicer then be my guest that like um, I've seen people program R in different environments as well and they are pretty good programmer all right, thanks for the explanation. Could you suggest a good alternative for Notepad++ for Mac? It's in the lecture at the end. Um, let me look it up because um, it used to be called Text Wrangler, but I think it got renamed to BB Edit. Um, let me let me check. Yeah, it's now called BB Edit. So for Mac, use BB Edit, and if you're on Linux, then use whatever you want. Like if you're capable enough to install Linux on your own then you don't need any advice from me on, on what kind of an, uh, a text editor to use. So VB edit um, for Mac. Uh, should be free so no problem Giorgio. Alright so let's um, what about Jupyter Notebooks? Um, really useful I know some people who are massive fans for Jupyter Notebooks um, and it it works really well because it also forces you to write documentation um, Jupyter Notebooks um, you used to have similar things in R which was called Sweeve and that is um, then you make a LaTeX type document so LaTeX is a is a make is a markup language like HTML and Sweeve allowed you to put um, the, the text so you can just write text and then you can do an R computation and then only show for example the figure that comes out um, and Sweeve allowed you to go and have some text and some R code and then directly generate a PDF um, but like I said you're free to use what you want um, and in the end it doesn't really matter because you're always talking to the R interpreter and the R interpreter doesn't change it doesn't matter if you use Jupyter Notebooks or if you use R Studio or if you use R what is the source to download Notepad++? Um, I always just Google Notepad++ download um, and then it's the first, it's uh, https notepad minus plus minus plus dot org um, and get the 64-bit release just so that it can handle like massive files um, um, I will, I can put the link in the chat probably so let's, ah, thank you moderator that's why we have a moderator to do these kinds of things all right, let's switch back to the to the lecture so that we don't spend like hours on the first lecture. Um, so this is the look and feel. Um, depending on what you use, it might look very different, but it always consists of these two essential parts. One of them is the console. So the console is where you can talk 
to the R interpreter and you have your graphic device um, which shows things like plots or heat maps or whatever you want to visualize and this is what I mean by one of the advantages of R. R has built-in graphics so uh, the, the graphics they are built into R and R understands what a figure is and uh, what what the x-axis is or the y-axis so it knows this um, and it's built into the, the programming language all right so let's start some first basic programming right so we can use R as a bar basic basic calculator yeah, so if I type in 1 plus 4 um, it will tell me 5 so I can show you a little bit of an example of that so hey, let's um, clear the window um, just so that we don't have the yeah why not just do it like this right then you can't see the error anymore so hey if I would type in 4 plus 1 it will say 5 so hey you can use R as a um, can you repeat the notepad plus plus version um, it depends on which computer you are using but there is I think a 32-bit and a 64-bit and nowadays people almost always have a 64-bit computer um, this allows you to use more memory so if you have a file which is one gigabyte big then the 32-bit version will not open it while the 64-bit version will allow you to open it because it's just bigger um, but it's uh, I can I have a Firefox window here as well um, so we can go to the download and then you just say well I want to have the latest release of course and then here it automatically defaults to the 32-bit version you don't want the 32-bit version you want to have the 64-bit version of course this depends on your operating system um, but the operating uh, if you're on Windows it will tell you that 64 bits is not supported by your system so you, you can't install the wrong version and the 32-bit version will work on a 64-bit Windows as well um, that, uh, so you can just get the installer double click next 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 finish and then you have it installed all right so let's move back so write um, just a basic calculator. So the R interpreter understands basic mathematics. Um, remember that the decimal separator in R, so separating like whole numbers from fractions of a number, is always the period in R and never the comma. So 5 comma 3, um, although in Europe this is very comma, uh, common to to do right it uses the American system so it's 5.3 um, for uh, 5 and 3 tenths um, there are some special operators like if you want to do the exponent then you can do uh, 5 and then um, this square hat thing 2 or you can do 5 uh, multiply multiply 2 and this is then 5 to the power of 2 which is 25 of course um, it supports Euclidean division and the Euclidean division remainder these are always difficult for people but Euclidean division and Euclidean division remainder occur a lot in computer science and there's a next slide which will explain what the Euclidean division is and what the Euclidean division remainder is um, R also has some special numerical constants so you can have inf which stands for infinite um, and there are two types of it there's positive infinity and negative infinity um, you have NAN which is not a number so when you are trying to convert the letter C into a number then it will say NAN not a number and R understands what a missing value is so NA the NA value is a missing value and this is this is significant when you do statistics if you do statistics then the statistics change based on missing values right if you calculate the mean um, then the mean is based on summing up all the numbers divided by the number of numbers if you have a missing value then R can deal with that so instead of having five values and a missing value um, so it will recognize that there's a missing value and do divide by six instead of divide by five um, so hey it, 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 it knows that a value can be missing NA's propagate so if you do something which results in an NA then having an NA plus something will still be NA and this is this is kind of a safety thing so that when you are dealing with missing values you as a programmer are forced to properly handle missing values um, which is really nice and not all programming languages have this um, especially the NAN is not very common and something like C um, 
cannot have um, integer values being missing. Floating point values have their own missing, but integers cannot be missing, but in R they can be missing. So it understands what a missing value is. All right, so Euclidean division. I don't know if people had this, but um, it's called... Euclidean division is very similar to long division, which when I was in elementary school and in high school, we were taught to do divisions this way. I know that nowadays they don't do this anymore. Um, but imagine that we want to divide 100 by 39, right? Then how I was taught to write, it, write this down is say, well, we have 39, which is the divisor, um, then we have 100 so that's the number that we want to divide and we put these brackets around it and the example would be better when we had a thousand but what you do is you try to say well one is not divisible by 39 10 is also not divisible by 39 a hundred you can divide by 39 and 39 fits into a hundred two times right so what you would do is you would then write down the two here and 2 times 39 is 78 and then when you subtract 78 from 100 you get 22 and the 2 so the amount of times that 39 fits wholly in 100 is called the Euclidean divisor and 22 is what remains after doing this division is that clear? I hope so it comes back a lot in computer science. It's not something that you would be confronted with the first two or three lectures, um, but it, it is something which is relatively... Um, it, it comes back a lot. For some reason in computer science you often work with Euclidean division and not, in, or, and not floating point division. Right? Floating point division would say two point something, um, but in this case you want to know how often something is in the number wholly and when you do that how much is left. Um, there are more things which are built into R. So there are built-in character constants. So letters in R are the 26 uppercase letters of the Roman alphabet. So um, you have letters written with small letters and those are the 26 lowercase letters of the Roman alphabet. R understands what a date and a time is, it also understands what a month is, it knows that January is the first month and February the second month, so month.abb is the three letter abbreviations for the English month names and if you want to have the full name of the month you can use month.name. Furthermore R has a whole bunch of built-in constants, things like pi and e and, and, and these kinds of kind of magical numbers and uh, pi, I hope that everyone knows that 2 times pi times r is the circumference of a, of a circle. And so pi is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. Um, so 2 times pi times r is actually 2 or pi times the diameter. Um, but so you can do circle calculations and these things as well. Um, one of the things that I want to point out here, because I saw that in, um, um, in the assignments it often goes wrong. Um, so letters is just a vector. So if I want to know what, for example, the 16th letter is of the alphabet, I can just do this. So I can use the square brackets to select from a vector. So here, from the vector letters, I select the 16th letter, um, which is the letter P, capital, because I'm using capital letters. Um, so remember that these built-in constants are just vectors. Um, we will come back to, to vectors um, during the rest of the lecture, but just so that you know that you can select from them, just like you can select from any vector in R. R also support imaginary numbers. So in case you are doing like things with springs and spring constants, then um, using imaginary numbers is, um, is necessary to calculate some stuff. It doesn't support it directly. So if I ask R, what the square root of minus 1 is, it will say that the square root of minus 1 is not a number. But if I ask for the square root of minus 1 plus 0 imaginary part, then it will say that, oh, the square root of minus 1 is i. So it understands imaginary numbers and it allows you to compute with imaginary numbers. And this is very useful um, when you are doing um, 
mathematics which goes into things like spring constants so have if I have a, 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 a spring with a little weight on there and I pull it and it goes up and down um, then to calculate the, the dampening of the wave uh, you need to use imaginary numbers so it, it can understand that but you have to force it so you have to be explicit that you want to use it so normally it will say no it's not a number but you can do this it supports all basic trigonometry functions like sine cosine tangent arc cosine arc co and these kinds of things and it can do logarithms so the thing that you have to remember is that normally we would write ln of 5 for the natural logarithm so log 5 is 2 point something and so you use the two point something base so the, the natural logarithm um, so the e value if you want to have a base 10 logarithm of 5 you have to explicitly say the log 10 of 5 so this is a little bit confusing because many people um, on on your pocket calculator it has a, a button which says log and then the log button is the log 10 and it has a button which is called ln and this ln button is the natural logarithm um, so in R, the log is actually the natural logarithm. If you want to have the log base 10, then you have to type in log 10 of 5. Um, and the inverse, of course, is called exp for exponent, um, which is e to the power of 1 in this case. So if you want to have e to the power of 15, you can just type exp 15. Um, and that it will come back later on. It's not that important now, it's just that you know and that you get a little bit familiar with all the options. Um, so imaginary numbers are supported, trigonometry is all supported, and logarithms are also supported. Operator precedence, um, so the order of operations, is um, very similar to normal mathematics. We do first do exponents and roots, then we do multiplication and division, and then addition and subtraction, um, and it follows the standard PEMDAS system. Um, there's probably a German... Um, German version of the PEMDAS. Um, so in English you get taught that PEMDAS are please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So this st stands for um, um, uh, power, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And question to you guys, if I have this 10 minus 3 times 2, what is the answer of this? These are these things that you see on Facebook, right? Your your aunt on Facebook um, does these things. All right, so four, 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 good. Yeah, that that's pretty good. So norm, no no one comes up with fourteen. Like on Facebook, like fifty percent of people just fill in um, fourteen for some reason because they don't understand operator preference. But hand, like you first do the multiplication and then you do the subtraction. <laughs> All right, so that's how this works. Um, you can always override operator precedence by using um, brackets. So if I really want to do the m minus first, then I would say round bracket open, 10 minus three, round bracket close times two, and then it will first do the, the so you can always override it. Short break. So we're a little bit behind, so I will try and speed up a little bit, but um, so. There's a lot of things in R. So in R, when you start R, you start a session. And the session is something that is, um, that is holding everything that you load. In R, everything that you load goes into your RAM memory. So if you have a computer which has 4 gigabytes of RAM, then you can only load in 4 gigabytes of data in R. And this is one of these drawbacks of R, is that it is like Google Chrome, it will eat your memory and it will eat your memory quick. Um, and, and depending on which version of R you install, you have a certain amount of memory that you can use. And this also hang, or this is also dependent on your, uh, on on your, um, on the on the. Uh, this is also dependent on the data uh, that you load, so the size of the data, the type of the data, so characters take a little bit more than, for example, integers. Um, so, but that remember that everything is in your random access memory. There are some functions that you can use to manage your session. So you can do get working directory and this will tell you where you currently are on your hard drive. Um, you can do dir 
which will give you the files. Oh, the, which will give you the files that are there. Um, so hey, I can go to my D drive and I can ask which files are located here. If I want to move to another position on my hard drive, so to a different folder or to a different um, different uh, hard drive, I can use the set working directory. And the ls function shows you which variables are currently loaded in your session. Um, so let me give you a small and quick example of that. Um, so when we go to the R session, um, I can define, for example, something like X, right? And I can set my working directory to be on my D drive. Um, now I'm at my D drive and now I can do something like dir. And this will show me the files that are there. So there's a recycle bin. I have a backup of the USB stick of Gudrun that I got. Um, I have a recycler, which is similar to the recycle bin. And I have some kind of a text file here. Um, then I have two folders called D drive and E drive. And I have a recovery folder. Right? So I can also go into these folders uh, by setting my working directory, for example, like this. Um, and now when I do it there, you can see what is there. So I have like several folders. Um, one is called for Manuel. Um, I have like a GBIC folder and Lagezo and these kinds of things. If I want to know which variables I have already defined, I can use the ls function. So when I use the ls function, I see that there's one variable defined and this variable is called x. Um, I can of course define more variables. So I could define y being seven and then I can define seven being nine, right? And now when I do ls, it shows me that I have three variables defined called x, y, and z. So the ls shows you what is in your session. The dir shows you what is on the hard drive. If I wanna know where I am on the hard drive, I can do a get working directory and this will show me I'm at the d, uh, the d hard drive in Windows and then I'm in the folder called D drive. Um, the reason why I have D and E separated is because of historical reasons. So don't worry about that. In your hard drive, it will look different. If you want to install a package, you can use the function install.packages. Um, for example, the QTL package um, for quantitative trait locus mapping. But like I said, there are more than 4,000 packages in the, standard R, um, the, uh, in the standard R repository. There are literally hundreds of thousands of packages for R um, which are created. And during the lecture series, we will actually create our own package as well. Installing a package does nothing. It just gets it from online, installs it on your computer and makes it available. But it, it doesn't load it. It doesn't bring the functions that are inside of the package into the session. If you want to use something from this QTL package, for example, you first have to load it. So you say library QTL. And here you don't have to put the brackets surrounding it, so the, the, the double quotes, um, but you could put the double quotes here as well. And this will make the package available, so any function which is given to you by this package will now be available in R. It is not available until you load or until you do the library call. You can save an object um, in an R data format, so it's much smaller or it's smaller on your hard drive. Like if I have a big text file, which is two gigabytes big, then when I load it into R, R will have an internal representation, which might be much smaller than the original text representation. Um, so I can save that object in case I want to load it later. I can say save, then the name of the variable containing the object and then I can say save it to for example your.rdata or my.rdata or I can just give it any name. I can save everything so I can save the whole environment right so in my environment that I had here um, I have x y and z so I can save one object so I can say save the x object and call this uh, or put this in a file called x.rdata um, and I could save everything uh, using save.image and now save.image will save x, y and z. Um, if I would now clear my session, um, I think we had the clear session somewhere. So if I remove everything from the session, now nothing is loaded. If I now just type load and I type load x dot, uh, dot r data now, if I do an ls, it now loaded back in x, y, and z. 
and the values that it that we put in there are still in there so it's a it's an easier way to kind of hey if imagine that um, you're programming and someone calls you that your house is well not your house but the house of your friend is on fire so you have to leave now and then you can just tape si save that image give it a file name and run out of the door and then everything is saved so if your computer will shut down then you don't lose any work um, if you want to quit um, you can use like the, the button here to quit the R session um, but um, if you are writing scripts then you have to quit the session but if it's called both, yeah, well, I just overwrote the file, right? So I, I wrote the same file twice. I, I once wrote x.r data containing only x, and then I overwrote the file. So that, yeah, I could have given it a different name. Um, should have given it a different name. Um, um, Q with no will quit the R session and not save the workspace. This is one of these things that I always hammer on is never ever save your default workspace. If you want to save your workspace or you want to save the whole environment, you'd use save.image. Um, if I would go, I don't know if you guys can see that, but when I click this button here, oh no, you don't see, it will, um, it will put up one of these questions and it will save workspace image question mark and then it gives you three options yes no and cancel if you if you click the yes button then it will save an, a hidden file in your my documents folder called dot r data the next time that you start r it will load everything which is in this hidden file which can be really annoying because if i just if, if in my session I have four gigabytes of data and I click save workspace image and I click yes then the next time that I start R it will take me half an hour for R to start up because it's loading in all these four gigabytes of data and only then is it available so my advice to you is never save your workspace using the kind of question that it poses to you save workspace image no and that's why in in the slide here when i do q so when i call quit i always say no don't save the workspace and this again comes in with the repeatability of research and uh, the fact that by saving the workspace stuff keeps floating around which you don't want to have floating around is there a way to make uh, to check whether this has happened? Yes. If you open up your R window and you type ls, then it should show nothing. So it should be uh, more or less empty, right? So if I would um, go to my R window, right, and I would do ls, now you see that I have stuff loaded. Um, so this means that it that it saved this sneaky file. No, then it will just ask you. So if you just do Q like this, then it will pop up this window asking you if you want to save the workspace image. Yes, no, or cancel. Um, I, I don't know if cancel is actually an option. No. So you can only say yes or no. But n never say yes. Always say no. So that's just my tip. Because it will, it will hurt you in the long run. Um, because... Head some variable x might be floating around from when you did a previous analysis and you don't want that you want the whole analysis to be nothing more than what you put in your script all right so this is just a little bit about managing your session of course um, like i told you in r help is always available so if you do question mark and then the name of a function um, then it opens up the help file for this function if I do question mark, if, if I just, if I don't know the function that I'm searching for, um, I can do double question mark and then a search term. So, for example, if I want to open up the help file for the sec function, I just do question mark sec. If I want to open up the help file for the plus function, like I told you, every function in R has a help file, even plus, even just addition. Um, but because plus is a special symbol, you then have to do the air quotes surrounding it so that it knows that you want to look at the help file for the plus function. And the help file for the plus function is really dumb because it just says this does addition, um, which is 
good, but it has an example. So if you don't know how addition works, there is an example there. Um, if you want to search for something, like if you want to search for a function which deals with things like obesity, then you can do question mark, question mark, obesity. It will pop up a, um, a browser and in the browser you will see a list of things where the word obesity is mentioned. So hey, you can search for obesity, but you can also search for other things. Um, so hey, if you want to do things like um, chi-square, hey, then you do question mark, question mark, chi, um, and then it will search for chi-squares or chi, or everything that, that hits chi. All right, so the type system. And now it starts becoming interesting because there are different types in R. And these types of data are very important because they, they change the way that R looks at data. So of course the most basic type that you can come up with is the logical type. So the logical type is true, be encoded by one, and false encoded by zero. Or that's not entirely true, because false is zero, and true is defined as everything besides zero. So the logical values, true and false, false being zero, true being everything else but zero. If you transform a true to a numerical value, then the, the false value has a numerical value of zero and the true will have a numerical value of one. But if I transform five to a logical, then five will be true. Numeric values are just numeric values. So that means it's five, it's 7.9 or 100.6. R has no notion of floating point numbers versus integers. A lot of programming languages make this distinction that something can be an integer, meaning 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 until infinity, um, and a floating point number like 2.3 or 7.9. R doesn't make that distinction. R just has a numerical value, and a numerical value is any number. We have character values, and character values are poorly named because character values can be single characters, but can also be multiple characters. So um, the, the string one is a character type. Uh, two is also a character type. The vector type is then a list of things. So I can use the C function, the combine function, to combine things together into a list of elements. And this list of elements gets the type, the highest type. So this is the lowest type, intermediate type, and this is the highest type. And that is because a numeric value can be converted to a character, but a character cannot be converted to a numeric. So it has a kind of layered um, type system. Um, vectors are, there's three different types of vectors. You have numeric vectors, character vectors, and logical vectors. Um, so I can have like a vector containing 1, 2, 5.3, 6, and minus 2.4, uh, or minus 2 and 4. And I can put this in something called v1. So here I define a variable v1. I use the combine function to combine these numbers together in a vector. I can create a character vector the same way, and I can create a logical vector exactly the same way. There's also a matrix type, which is a kind of tabular form. Um, and here I am creating a matrix, which has the numbers 1 to 20 in there. It has five rows and four columns, and then I store it in a variable called y. Um, is this clear? Well doesn't matter if it's clear there will be a short quiz in a short while anyway so if you want to work with types then there are some um, helpful functions um, something like the length um, of an object so the, if you ask for length of the name of a variable it will tell you how many elements there are in so if we would type if we would define these three vectors like for example vector number two and I would say length of v2 then it will tell you three. There's three elements in V2, like one, two, and three. Um, if I would ask for the length of V3, it will be five, because there's five logical units in this vector. The SDR is, is useful when you have more complex objects, because you can have a, a, a list with a vector with a matrix in there. So the SDR just gives you the structure of an object. Um, and the class of an object will tell you what class or what type an object is. So if I say class of v2, then it will say character. 
if I ask for the class of v3, it will say logical. Um, the names of an object, in R you can name things. So you can create a vector which has names um, and then you can um, get the names of the object as well. So um, let me give you a small example of that. Um, so we saw this um, v2, right, which is um, 1, 2, and 3. And now when I type v2, you see that it has three elements in there. Um, but I can give it names as well. So I can say um, a1 um, equals 1, uh, a3 equals 2, and um, b1 um, equals 3. And now when I type v2, it will give names to this object. So if I now want to select this element from the vector, I can use v2, give me the second element, or I can say from v2, give me the element named b1, right? And then it will take the b1 element. So you can name anything, and this is really useful. Um, because often when you have measurements, um, measurements are done on individuals and bec because of that the individuals have names. So you want to, you, you often or you almost always want to use names for things to make them descriptive and to make your script more useful. Um, this is especially true for here when I say from V2 select the second element it is better to select it by the name A3. And why is that? Well, if I would take V2 and I would rename or and I would add something to V2, right? For example, um, the object A with having a name um, called um, Hari or something like that, um, right? Now, when I say V2 element 2, the second element is now not the second element that it was. But if I would select V2 b1 I would still get the same thing so it's good to use names because names don't names don't change when you add or remove things from a vector while the index like 1 2 3 4 can change when you add or when you remove things um, so just a tip if you can use names use names how to know which brackets to use yeah that's that's a very very difficult question so there's a whole slide on brackets and brackets is the thing that just like it's it's gonna be difficult um, square brackets are for selecting things from a list round brackets are calling functions and the C is a function so I say C one two three to combine these three things together because C is a built-in function um, V2 is not a built-in function it is a list and if I want to select something from a list I use the square brackets and you also have like the curly brackets and we will get to those but there's a slide about it so I will just continue you can force things to be a certain type or you can ask if something is of a certain type so if I want to know if a certain thing is a numerical value um, let's go back to R I can say um, is numeric v2 and it will say no v2 is not numeric if I want to ask if it is a character, then it will say yes, V2 is a character. So hey, you can, and I can also force things to be or to go from one type to another. Does R put additions in a vector always on the first place or does it sort the element? No, I actually put it in the first place, right? I said here combine Harry equals A and then V2. If I want to add something at the end of v2, I can say v2 is combine v2 and then put something after v2, which is called um, lala um, equals 7, right? If I do this, now it will take v2 and then add to the back the number 7 with the name lala. However, if I now look at V2, then you see that the 7 actually was upgraded. I put in the numeric 7, but because the other elements are not numeric, it upgrades the 7 to be of a character type. And that is, this is the thing that goes wrong most of the time in R. So the R type system is complex. 
it tries to be very smart and sometimes it's too smart for its own good. Um, but depending on how I combine things, um, I, can, I can add it to the back or I can add it to the front. All right, so I can I can ask if certain something is of a certain type, and I can actually force it to be of a certain type as well. Um, so let's let's do this on uh, v2. I can say as numeric v2, and then it will say, well, I introduced NAs, right? Because some things cannot be converted to numerics. The only one which could be converted to a numeric is this last one. So the value 7 can be converted to 7, but a, 1, 2, and 3 cannot be converted to a numerical value, so those turn into NAs. So missing values, because I'm forcing it to be. Alright. So to create a vector or a matrix, if I want to create a vector, I can use the C function like we saw before, and then I can just name or throw in the objects that I want to combine. If I want to have a sequence, then I can also use the sec function, which creates a sequence from something to something by something. Um, and I can repeat something an X number of times. Um, so let's just give you a quick example of that. Um, so I can, for example, say um, C123, uh, right, which just creates a vector containing 1, 2, and 3. Um, I can do a sequence from 1 to 1,000 stepping by 50, right? So that's 1, 51, 101, 151. And I can say um, repeat the number A uh, 20 times. And then it just repeats the number A 20 times. So that's how you can create vectors out of nothing. Um, you can also create matrices. So um, the way to create matrices is using the matrix keyword. Then you say, you give it a vector. So these are the values that it go is going to put into the matrix. And then you have to specify the number of rows and then the number of columns. You can also use the C bind function. So the C bind function is when you already have a matrix and you want to add a column to the matrix. So I can say C bind an object to an object. So um, in this case, um, if I have a matrix, I can C bind to that matrix. So let's create a matrix, um, which has the numbers one to 20 in there. It has four rows, five columns, then it looks like this. Um, and I can store this in variable, for example, AA. Um, and now I can say C bind to AA, a new column called Denny and put in the values and now I have to give four values, of course, because the column has four um, elements. So one, uh, two, and three, and four. And now when you look at the matrix, it made a new column at the back called Denny, and it contains the values one, two, three, four. Of course, I could have bound it to the front as well by doing like this. And now the Denny column that I just created will be on the front. There's also a row bind function which does the same thing, but now it works on rows. So you can add a row on the bottom or an add a row on the top. So that's the R bind function. All right, so there's slightly different ways to create a vector as well. There's this double point operator, which will, which is a shorthand for the sec function. Um, and that is just go from one to four, stepping by one. So it's, it's sec one four, uh, so it's sec one four comma one, um, but you can also write one two four. Um, here for the matrix, some examples on how to do that. Um, hey, and you can C bind stuff together, or you can row bind vectors together to create a matrix as well. All right, so when we type or when, when you type the name of a vector, right, you see that it puts these numbers in front. And when I type a matrix, you see that it automatically numbers the columns. Um, so these are the indexes. So this is the first row. This is the first column like this. So the indexes are automatically assigned by R unless you give it names. So if I want to get stuff out of a vector, I always use the square brackets. If I want to, for example, select the fifth element from a vector, if I have a vector which contains the, the letters A to I, and I want to select the fifth one, then I'm selecting the E. I can also, from the vector, so I can, I can use a vector 
as an index to a vector. So in this case I say from V select the second to the fifth element and then it will select for me A, B, C, uh, B, C, D and E. I can also from vector V select elements, so select, make a vector, combine, 2 to 5 and then also give me the eighth number of the vector. So this will give me B, C, D and E and it will also give me H. Is that clear? Um, it's, it's just a way, like you can use a numerical vector as the index to any vector to get the elements that you are interested in. But here you use the square brackets. Um, of course here you use the round brackets for the C function, so here I create a vector. Why do we need to C here? Well, we, because we, can, we need to specify that we also want element number 8. 2 to 5 gives us this, and then if we want to have the 8th element as well, then we need to create a vector which contains 2, 3, 4, 5 and 8. So that's why I'm using the C function here to combine the number 8 with the vector 2 to 5 and then I'm using this vector as the index to vector V. It's a little bit swiveling, so you can swivel around and select. And of course if I would put 8 in front, so if I would say C 8 comma 2 to 5, then it would give me the vector H, A, uh, if first H, no, that's not allowed. So V two to five comma eight will give you an error because you're not doing anything with like two to five comma eight is is not meaningful. That's not a yeah, so if I would just say V is um, letters and from letters give me the first ten or something. Um, C for combine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hey, if I would take V and I would take like the first letters and then from V I can select um, for example 1 to 5, I can also select the other way around, I can select 5 to 1, then it would select the, the other way around. Um, I can select um, for example element 1, 4, 7 and 9 um, and I also can select it the other way around, so I could also do something like this. So C combines and you can use any vector as an index to a vector. So you can use a numeric and a logical vector as it. So, but it will become more complex, like trust me, you can do a lot of weird things. But hey, just the basic understanding is that the square brackets here you use to select from V and the thing that we are selecting from V is, uh, is can be specified using the index and here we are using multi-indexing so we are saying combine 2 to 5 and then 8. It's something that you just have to practice, right? It's something that will become very very useful or very very um, natural to you when you continue using R for, for some time. We can also do the same, we can index from a matrix as well. Um, same strategy applies, so from a matrix and then now I within the square brackets I have to give two coordinates, one coordinate for which rows I want and then a coordinate for which column I want. So from matrix, if this is my matrix, when I say select the first to the third row from the first column, then I'm selecting these three numbers, so 0 0.7, 0 0.2 and 0 0.2. If I say from the fifth row give me the third to the sixth column then it will give me 0 0.42, 0 0.53, 0 0.47 so, yeah, so it just selects. Isn't that the German flag? Uh, kind of. <laughs> the colors are more or less randomly chosen and they, they, they change based on the system that I do. Um, I can actually also select a single element like here. Um, I can also select a whole column or a whole row by just leaving this empty. So if I say M square bracket open comma 9 square bracket close then it will know that oh I want to have the whole ninth column. Good. Is that clear? Then we will take a short break again. Um, let me think, what did I actually come up with um, for animated GIFs? So let me.